Good morning, Beggar's Table. It's good to be with you. I want to read you a quote from a, a, a German theologian. He says, if you want to start a big movement, then go ahead and make a big splash. If you want to be renowned, then go ahead and sound off. But if you want to see God's kingdom advance, stand before the cross and be quiet. I love those words. And it kind of summarizes what we've been doing during Lent. We're standing quietly at the cross and we're observing Jesus and we're listening to the last seven statements, the last seven words that he gave. Today we're diving into an especially provocative word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So I invite you to join this in what I think is a really timely conversation for everything that we're going through. Uh, again, I have invited my friend Rustin Smith, the pastor of Vox Day Community, to join me. And we both invite you to join us in our conversation. Rustin, the interesting thing about our word, uh, Jesus' word for this week, is that it's really the first word that he utters from the cross that is a word of suffering where he acknowledges his own suffering. If you think about it, he's, he has said, Father, forgive them. Mm. He has said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He has said, uh, woman, behold your son. But none of those words really, re really communicate the pain that he is going through. And today mm. we're addressing the first word that he says that really communicates that he is suffering and that he has pain. Mm. And so I think that this is the point where his words get really interesting and complex and to be honest with you, kind of scary, because I don't know about you, but I don't like it when my Savior admits suffering, right? And, and all of a sudden, the rest of the words from here on out are about his suffering, and they're really uncomfortable. I don't know. Do you experience them as uncomfortable? I do. Yeah, I think there's a part of me that wants Jesus to win all the time. Yeah, definitely. And so when he's displaying something that looks like weakness, that offends us, that offends a sensibility, that I have, and so immediately I have to question where does that sensibility come from? Because it doesn't come from Jesus. Yeah. In fact, it brings to mind uh, how Paul is, oh, you know, he's always working out his encounter with Jesus and the Jesus movement, and he, he says something about weakness and God's power being made perfect in weakness. There's, there's a dichotomy of power and weakness going on, a, a paradox. Uh, that just I I can't quite hang with. Um, yeah. But I know there's something here that's it, it always is deeply troubling to me, <laughs> and I feel the deep trouble that Jesus is in. Yeah. That paradox, power, weakness. That's probably something we'll continue to talk about throughout the rest of these words okay. because it's just there. But it is deeply mm. troubling. Mm. I will say this too. In a weird way, it's deeply comforting mm. at the same time because I know how I feel and how I experience God so much of the time. And so it's just, we'll get into that, okay. but what, what a mysterious word. So the word from today is from Mark 15, and this is verses 33 and 34. And I'm just reading the, the context here. It says, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. He cries this out in what we believe is Aramaic, and it's not easy to read, so I'll give it a shot, but I'll let you give it a shot too, okay? Oh, but it's great. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthume, sabachthume. You want to try it? No. Okay, all right. <laughs> what that translates to, sorry for, uh, sorry for all of you Aramaic scholars that I just butchered that, but what it translates to is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right. So, you know, we can't do this now. This is one of the great things we can do when we're all together. Um, but what I wanted to have my congregation do is to whisper that together, mm. you know, um, and, and then have silence and, and then ask them, how does it feel to whisper that and to hear each other whisper it? But mm. I just think it's really mysterious. And I, I, I'm going to go on record as saying that I don't think anyone can fully explain this. Because we're talking about God, Jesus, mm. saying, why did you, God, abandon me? Well, I came here for answers. Yeah, um, <laughs> did you really? Yeah. I should I, clarify, nobody can explain this but you. I, uh, yeah. You've graduated seminary. I expect you to, to tell uh, me. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, I want to encourage us to, uh, in all of us, of course, to really embrace the great and deep mystery here. Um, I have this quote from Brennan Manning, 
And he, this is from the furious longing of God. And he says, this is the moment in Jesus' life that is more shrouded in mystery, mm. denser with misunderstanding and incomprehensibility than perhaps any other. So what an interesting word for us to mm. dialogue about because Brennan Manning is saying, well, here is the point where we fall upon the most potential to just misunderstand. This is a fancy way of saying you can say a lot of stupid things about this, right? <laughs> People probably do say a lot yes. of silly things about this word because okay. it's so mysterious. Well, that's strangely comforting. Strangely comforting, okay. exactly. Yes. Um, Aslan, uh, in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, I, I like how C.S. Lewis put it when he um, sacrificed himself on the mm. stone slab. Right. Um, yeah. C.S. Lewis referred to it as deep magic Mm. and there's something about that uh the implication is that everything that was involved and everything that that meant can't necessarily be understood entirely maybe we just use the word magic for things that can't be understood (laughs) at least in children's fiction but i really believe that there's a sense that we have to be okay with that so okay yeah so going on Mm -hmm. Everything that I say from now, I, I want I want you to give me permission, and I give you permission, and all of you can give us permission to say stupid things, to say silly things, as we try to <laughs> interpret I, this word. I assume our congregations are used to that. <laughs> so you have, you have my permission. Okay. We're talking about mystery. We, we talk about it at Vox. Yeah. Magic mystery. The mm-hmm. Mystery is, is not a throw in the towel. You can't know anything about it. Mystery means that it is endlessly knowable. Endlessly so we're going to get in this and explore it in all sorts of ways without needing to have a definitive word mm-hmm. about everything this might mean. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, here's, a, here's the first silly thing I want to propose. Mm-hmm. And um, again, take this with a grain of salt. Mm. But I, I want to suggest that this is not a statement about God abandoning Jesus. This is a statement of Jesus expressing how he feels. So there's a subtle difference right. there. That in other words, I think that it's okay, or maybe I should say that we can, we can read this in a way in which God hasn't really abandoned Jesus because that I, that's more problematic for me. But I think we can read this in a way in which Jesus is expressing a very human experience. Mm. And that is the feeling that God has abandoned us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting to see where this is going. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, again, though, I mean, already I find in that uh, I mean, already you've got Jesus, who's this this mysterious character who is endlessly fascinating to me. And you know, I've, as you have been on this journey a long time, just pursuing him, trying to understand and know him better. And this is part of the reason he does this sort of thing in this kind of moment, and it draws me in. I want to know yeah. him and and what yeah. what he's going through. Well, as soon as I say that, I find it oddly comforting because. In my life, I go through seasons mm-hmm. where I feel like God is not there and absent. Mm-hmm. And so if I hear Jesus saying that he feels that too, then it helps me to know that I'm not being mm. unchrist like by feeling that way. Yeah. In fact, I'll admit to you, not to anyone else. No, no one else is listening. Yeah, but I'll admit to you that I probably go through that daily mm. of feeling there are times in my day where I feel like God is absent. Well, we'll pray for you. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. No, it's true. And you and I talk about this sort of thing mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of times. I mean, there's a sense in which you bind yourself to the church. Even, I mean, I was joking with our with a mutual friend that I became a pastor because I couldn't be a Christian. <laughs> but you might but, flesh that out. But well, the the, yeah. the the truth of it is, we bind ourselves to the community of faith because mm-hmm. my faith is not strong enough to carry me through every day. Sometimes I need you to believe for me right. and to stick with the practices, and the practices always lead me back to uh, connection to encounter with God, and then again I'm, oh there he is, and and right. I, I be, again I believe. Yeah, help me yeah. with my unbelief. Um, but I I. It reminded me of this G.K. Chesterton quote. Okay. He's one of my favorite authors. Yeah, me too. Uh, some of his stuff is of its time for sure. But <laughs> he made this comment in, in t- trying to make an apologetic about atheism. 
And he mm. said this, quote, let the atheists themselves choose a god. They will find only one divinity who ever uttered their isolation. Only one religion in which God seemed for an instant to be an atheist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that speaks a bit to what you're talking about. We all have these moments, maybe, maybe daily, if, we're, if we dare to get so honest, uh, of unbelief, mm -hmm. of atheism, or at least of, of doubt. And, um, and here we find even an answer for that, even a connection of our own basic doubt to this God who suffers, as Moltmann wrote about. Uh, there he is, uttering the very thing that we're feeling, drawing us back into relationships, saying, I know what it's like. Yeah, mm. which is which, just it unbelievably makes space within our faith for so many people. Yes, A lot of people that probably don't think they have a place in Christianity have a place in Christianity because they can that's, relate to Jesus in a way they don't know no, yet. That's, that's really beautiful. Yeah. Well, one of my quote what, here's a quote that I want to throw out that this reminded me of is mm. this this idea that I feel like God has abandoned me. This is from another one of my favorite authors. I like Chesterton too. This is Thomas Merton, who I also know that you love. Mm. Thomas Merton says, uh, "God, who is everywhere, never leaves us." So that affirms that idea that God mm. has not abandoned Jesus. Right. But then he goes on to say, "Yet he seems sometimes to be present and sometimes absent." And then he says, if we do not know him well, we do not realize that he, be, he, that he may be more present to us when he is absent than when he is present, which is, is pretty mm -hmm. profound if you think about it. More present to us when he seems absent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can, but only yeah, can, for, you, can you explain that a bit more to me? <laughs> not really. Uh, <laughs> only for those who uh, know him well. It kind of, Rustin, it kind of brings me to my second point. I really only have two. Okay. The first one is that I don't think God abandoned Jesus, but Jesus feels abandoned. All right. And the second point is this. I believe that part of the journey towards maturity in Christ involves going through experience of feeling like God has abandoned us. Um, Mm. I, I, I really believe that if we harbor any hope of really growing into the fullness of Christ, and in, in, in as we talk about our false self and our true self, if we harbor any hope of really dying to our false self, then this is something that we have to experience at some point in our life, mm. very profoundly. Um, and I can't fully explain all of that, mm. but I, I know that... Uh, a lot of great sages have written about the dark night of the soul. And that's what I think that this relates to, that feeling of complete abandonment of God. The feeling that we have a complete loss of control, that feeling that we talk about of death, yeah. um, which some of us are probably feeling like right now. Yeah. And um, I just think that that's something that we have to go through at some point in time if we want to grow into the fullness of Christ. Because... It leads us into a relationship with God where we are not just, well, I, I, it leads us into a relationship where we are wrestling with God and there's a tension mm. there. And I think that maturity comes through tension. Yeah. Does that make sense at all? It does. And it, it harkens back to a, a previous word from the cross about being with Jesus in mm -hmm. paradise. The key word there being with Jesus yeah. and not necessarily worrying about the meaning of paradise. Uh, even this is a, is a way that Jesus is drawing us back to himself, mm -hmm. saying, I, it, it's not just you becoming like me, but I'm, I'm already like you. Yeah, I already right. experienced what you experienced, and I'm with you so that you can be with me. That's awesome. Mm. That is awesome. I, um, I, I think that it kind of highlights the word, and I know at Vox you've been highlighting one word from each of these last words. Yes. And the word that... Um, that we had discussed that you guys are highlighting this week and that I, I love this is the word why. Yeah. Why is a profound word. It's when profound. you think about our relationship with God and our yeah. faith journey, mm -hmm. this is a word why that I feel like we avoid. Like I don't want to have mm -hmm. to ask why. Yeah. People come to church to get answers, not ask why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's what I've heard. That's, that's true. what you heard. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but here... Yes. But here's Jesus himself saying why. And there's no answer yeah. given. No. Right? There's not. Yeah. So I think that... Darn it. Yeah. <laughs> but yet it's oddly comforting yeah. at the same time. Because I yeah. think this is, 
This is the journey that all of us have to go on mm-hmm. to get to a place where we say, why? God, why have you forsaken me? Why does it feel like you've forsaken me? Yeah. And I think that, as I've said, that's the pathway to great spiritual maturity, mm-hmm. to wrestle with that, to sit with it and wrestle with it. Yeah, which speaks to our moment. I don't want to get ahead of where you're going, but yeah. we're in a moment right now right. where, I mean, some people are probably still just like doing totally fine. I I've, I was in our small group last night o- online and uh, was checking in with people. Um, I've gotten to, you know, about half the church so far, just checking in with people and people are all over the place. Some people are just doing this no problem. Other people are already beginning to feel like, wow, our house feels a lot smaller than it used to feel. Yeah. And at some point, this is going to go on long enough that at some point, this question why is going to be a giant question mm-hmm. just in addressing the moment that right. we're in. Right. So I think one of the, I mean, if we dare do application, I think one of the the things in this is uh, this word is a word of giving us permission to feel everything that we're feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a phrase that goes around in counseling circles called spiritual bypassing. And sometimes the church is guilty of this. Um, I brought the definition spiritual bypassing is this, is the tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices, you know, like going to church or praying or using cheerful spiritual Bible language. study and, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, quoting Romans eight twenty eight too often, that, right. that kind of thing. Although that's one of my favorite verses. Mm-hmm. It's using those things to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, and unfinished developmental tasks. Mm. Or in our case, it's racing to the spiritual answer to avoid feeling, you know, the potential darkness that comes with this uncertainty that we're right. living in. Right. It's a danger and a risk. And I think something as a pastor, I want to, I want people to be aware of. Yeah, definitely. Uh, something to guard against or, or to feel permission yeah. to say how you feel, reach yeah. out to a friend, talk about it. Mm. That's really wise. Mm. I, I totally agree. Um, I, and I think that the message of the resurrection is that there's a kind of life mm. that we can only live if we allow ourselves to go through that darkness, mm. right? I mean, well, think about it even on, a, on the level I was just speaking of, of reaching out. Mm-hmm. If I can get honest about uh, the pain that I'm experiencing mm-hmm. and reach out to you, as I often do, uh, then suddenly there's a blessing. Even though I'm still in pain, I'm now connected. And I have a friend who knows mm. me and see, sees the real me. And you know, I've brought my pain out into the light and in the context of a, of a spiritual friendship where now it's in the presence of God mm-hmm. and, and can be healed. Mm-hmm. Um, I often think about the Psalms in that way. I know you've taught this at, at Beggars. The Psalms uh, is, is a prayer language, the book of Psalms, given us uh, to express all these sorts of dark things. And one, one of the kind of implicit lessons in that is that it teaches us that our language, even our complaints, our fears, our darkness, has a place in the presence of God, in relationship with God. Interestingly, this is where Jesus himself goes when he's in the, the most pain, potentially, of his entire life. Right. What comes out of him is the psalm language, Psalm 22. Yeah, he's referencing Psalm 22 here. Yeah, yeah which, is, which is a beautiful psalm. We probably won't read the whole thing right now because it's a long psalm. Yeah. But as you know, it, it goes through the despair, mm-hmm. really the what sounds like the despair of the cross. Yes. And, but it ends in, in hope, right? It does. Yeah. Yes. And I assume that Jesus has this in his head. I mean, this is their song book, right? So Jesus knows the words of the Psalms. Like we know in our culture, like lyrics to, you know, Taylor Swift songs. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to change that <laughs> from my congregation. Let's like, not go Taylor Swift. Queen songs. Like Queen songs. There you go. All right. Yeah. I can relate. Now you I get you. Relate. Yeah. So in this moment, these are the words, though, that Jesus just has rolling around in his head, like we have song lyrics or, right. or movie quotes. Or, exactly. You know, this is what comes out of Jesus. So he's he's connecting to this painful part of the, of the song that he's singing, but that song doesn't stay there. By the time it gets, you know, to the swelling refrain, in the end, and I would invite, you know, our listeners to go read it after this mm-hmm. or before. Um, it ends with, among other things, the poor will be satisfied. 
how much hope does that give us in a moment like this where even our government is wrestling through how do we yeah. care for the most vulnerable? Yeah. The poor will be satisfied. The rich will worship, which to me is you know getting your, their priorities straight. Mm-hmm. And future generations will be told about the Lord. Mm. That's where that psalm ends. And certainly some of this happens and is happening, especially in the context of the church during times of crisis. Definitely. That's beautiful. It, it moves from utter despair to a little bit of hope. Yeah. Which is so powerful. That is really powerful. Which might be approaching a good place for us to end. Mm-hmm. Um um, I, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to wrap up with. I have a quote from Brendan Manning I wouldn't mind reading. I'd love to hear it. Okay, this is, um, he says here, um, unwavering trust is a rare and precious thing because it often demands a degree of courage that borders on the heroic. Mm. So here we are kind of talking about trusting Jesus and trusting the Psalm 22, that things end in hope, yes. right? He says, when the shadow of Jesus' cross falls across our lives in the form of failure, rejection, abandonment, betrayal, unemployment, loneliness, depression, the loss of a loved one, he's naming things that are all involved in death. That's right. And it would include what we're going through now, isolation, um, lack of control. Yes. Um, We we call them at Vox death experiences death experiences yeah i like that these are all death experiences which is exactly what we're all being thrust into right now that's right by the way we're always thrust into death experiences we never choose them right we're (laughs) always thrust into them so when wait i get but i gave up chocolate yeah (laughs) that is that's that's up there that's up there so way to go man (laughs) But when the shadow of Jesus crossed, these death death experiences fall across our lives in any of these forms. When we are deaf to everything but the shriek of our own pain, when the world around us suddenly seems a hostile, menacing place, at those times we may cry out in anguish, how could a loving God permit this to happen? Mm -hmm. Which is what Jesus is crying out from the cross here. And it's what you just alluded to, that we would all cry out, even as this might get worse and worse, and as our time of isolation gets longer and longer. Mm -hmm. At such moments, Brendan Manning says, the seeds of distrust are sown. Distrust. It requires heroic courage to trust in the love of God no matter what happens to us. And Mm -hmm. that's really, I think, what we're encouraging people to do is that heroic trust that God Mm -hmm. doesn't abandon us. We, uh, we, we, We cling to the words of Hebrews 13, I will never leave you or forsake you, mm. even when it feels like maybe he has. But we, we have heroic trust that it plays out. Mm. Yeah. Well, amen to that. I, I want that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, let me send us on uh, with a blessing uh, for you, for Beggar's Table folks, and for Fox folks who are watching and friends uh, beyond us. Uh, This is another blessing we often use at the end of our service at Vox. It goes like this. As you have been fed at this table, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing that you have received from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be always with you. Amen. Amen.